looked at second chapter of First Corinthians, and we sort of went through it. I'd like to refer us back to that. We're going to sort of play off of that, not go back over it, but just sort of uh, remind ourselves what we were looking at. And our study last week was sort of looking at the fact that we have been conditioned by the world. That is something that we have to recognize. It's all that we know. And the second chapter of Corinthians there was Paul, where he was seeking to help the Corinthians to understand what his purpose was, or I should say the Lord's purpose through him, in, uh, in what he was doing, not, any, not only just simply forming the church, but also the things that he was bringing to the church, that it was the Holy Spirit's effort to bring to us the amazing thoughts of God. And that it only can be accomplished if we become spiritual or be spiritual rather than earthly. So we're going to have to combat this thing of earthliness because, once again, that's all we know. But God is calling us to to things that are higher. So as we were looking at this uh, uh, passage, it ended uh, telling us or reminding us that we have the mind, or Paul was seeking to establish the mind of Jesus Christ within uh, his people. Let me just sort of get to that last slide there. But then he also brought something else to view. As he went into the next chapter, let me just sort of pick up there in verse uh, 16. It says, for who has known or understood the mind, the counsels, or amplified translation, the counsels and the purposes of the Lord, so as to guide the to as so as to guide and instruct him and give him knowledge. But we have the mind of Christ or the Messiah and do hold the thoughts and the feelings and the purposes of his heart or Christ's heart. But then as he was coming into the next chapter and as he was beginning to deal with some of the problems and the situation with the Corinthians, he started out this way. He says, however, brethren, I could not talk to you uh, to, as to spiritual men. And then he goes on and gives the picture of, of their youthfulness in the spirit or usefulness in walk. Actually, he says that they are infants or babes in Christ. And he goes on and he expounds upon that. And then he sort of lunches into the problem. So we see that with the Corinthians, and it's not just the Corinthians, I think it's it's everyone who chooses to follow Jesus Christ. We have to recognize where we are, where we started, but also where God wants to take us. Not that we will remain in the thought process or the thinking process of the world, but to grasp and to invite really and to give thought to the greatness of the thoughts of our God. In other words, let me put it in simple terms, because Paul talked about the natural man. How do you know the natural man? He didn't understand. He couldn't comprehend the spiritual things compared to the spiritual man who appraised all things. And he came to an understanding. It wasn't the person's ability. It was the spirit of God working within the person in order to bring them to the point. So we want to continue on from that. And also remember the fable. We started the fable starting out of looking at, and it has a very uh, uh, amazing point to it, of an eagle that was acting like a chicken. And the reason that he was acting like a chicken was from from, uh, uh, the youngest point, as he was thrown out or or fell out of the the nest, the farmer adopted him and just sort of put him in a chicken coop with all of the other chickens. So he grew up and he was doing all the things or all the characteristics of a chicken because that's all he knew until this naturalist came about and made the attempts, three attempts in order to help the eagle to understand who he really was. And that final attempt, he succeeded and the eagle took off and he flew and took his rightful position. So we keep that in mind too, as we go through this, but I want to look at one, one more passage and then we're going to look at a couple of things that the scripture brings to us and shows to us as well and how we can combat our earthly tendencies that that we're going to continue to face as long as we're here, but the the scriptures calls us to something higher. So let's go to to James. 
And since we were talking about wisdom in the second chapter of 1 Corinthians, because the things that God brings to us, it is his wisdom. And it is wisdom that comes from above. Uh, and James talks about this as well. And I want to remind us what he says here about it. Uh, James does, because apparently James was having the same problem with the Christians that, of his time and what who he was writing with as well. They were seeking for wisdom and they had adopted a a wisdom. I'm going to say a wisdom. But James is pointing out, wait a minute, you have adopted the wrong type of wisdom. And, and the, the wisdom that you have adopted is the earthly wisdom. Notice what he says. I'm going to pick up there in verse 13. James chapter 3, verse 13. He says, who among you is wise and understanding? And that should be our goal. We should be seeking wisdom. And we should be coming to the point that we seek to understand the things of God. So James is bringing them to this point. He says, let him show by his good behavior, his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. So we are to be uh, seeking to, to obtain wisdom. Look at verse 14. He says, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be uh, arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from heaven. So in other words, they have adopted a certain type of wisdom. And in their search for wisdom, they have found certain things. But James wanted to understand, look at the wisdom that you have. Because the wisdom from above can be distinguished from the wisdom that is earthly. And James here gives two signs of earthly wisdom. So, so it can be distinguished from the right thing. And he points out, and I'm pretty sure there's other characteristics as well, but here he points out jealousy and selfish ambition. If the wisdom that we have or that we seek develops that within us, very clearly, it's the wrong type of wisdom. That is not the wisdom that comes from above. But he, here's how James describes it. He says, but it is earthly. It is natural. Remember the natural man. And then here's one that should really get a person's attention or people's attention. He even says it is demonic. If the result of the wisdom that we are having, that we're seeking, results in jealousy and selfish ambition, it, it is an earthly wisdom. It is a demonic wisdom. And it is a natural wisdom. He explains. He says, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. Two more characteristics that, that help us to understand or be able to see and distinguish earthly wisdom. Disorder. We know that our God is not a God of disorder. He's not. And whenever that, that is present, we know that somewhere along the line, we have gotten away from God. And every evil thing too, uh, uh, godly wisdom or the wisdom from above does not promote evil. Matter of fact, it's a, the exact opposite. It exposes it so that it can be rightly and properly dealt with. But then he goes on in verse 17. He says, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then Peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, uh, good fruits, unwavering, and without hypocrisy. <clears throat> and the seed whose fruit is righteousness, get this last part, because here's the principle. The seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So here are the elements of the uh, wisdom that comes from above. And the sort of the end result, instead of disorder and chaos, it brings about peace. And we know the use with peace is unity. So the two can be distinguished. So yes, we are to be wise. Yes, we are to pursue wisdom. We have to understand there's two types of wisdom, earthly as well as uh, uh, godly. Paul, in that second chapter that we saw, he was seeking to bring forth the things of God and the things of the Spirit, or I put it that it is the Spirit of God that helps us to understand those things and give us that ability. So here's what I want to look at in the last part. Let's go back to this thing of earthliness. How do we overcome it? 
because we have to overcome it. Otherwise, we will always be not able to understand the amazing things that God wants to give us. Let me remind us a, a, a thought that the Lord gives us. And this, this came from his people of old. And we always have to remind ourselves when we give thought, when we hear, when we study, when we seek, when we're seeking for wisdom and we're seeking from wisdom that comes from God. This is this thought has to constantly uh, run through our mind. And the Lord gave it during Isaiah's time, Isaiah chapter 55, verses eight and nine. This is the Lord speaking. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. And we have to always recall this. God is speaking or seeking to speak on a much higher plane than earthly ways or earthly things or earthly thoughts. So we have to remind ourselves, wait a minute, if this is coming from God, it's going to be so much above what is natural and normal to me, what is earthly to me. He also says, either are, are your ways my ways. So we cannot understand God completely by the ways of man. We're going to fall far, far short. Far, far short. So he says his ways or our ways are not like his ways, declares the Lord. He says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So we have earthly ways, earthly thoughts, and then we have God's. And God's is so much higher. We always have to remind ourselves. So here's what I want to look at uh, in, during our time tonight. So how do we get away? And maybe that's not a good way of putting it. Let me put, let me try it again. How do we control our earthliness? How do we control our earthliness? Let's see. There's two things that stand out to me and others may come to mind as you give thought to it, that God helps us in this because we need amazing help because we're, we're just like an eagle. God has made us so much greater than what we were before, but we have the tendency to act like chickens rather than eagles of who we really are. So how can we break out of this and break out of this? Let's look at the first way. And this is really interesting. Let me see if I can perk your thinking. Think with me. I'm going to give you a list of men. And think about these men, their lives. And seek to tell me what do they have in common? Now, let me tell you to get some one thing out of the way right away, because I think you have jumped to this one first. Yes, they did all serve God. Yes, they were all in obedience to God, but that's not what I'm looking for. They had something else in common where God helped them to break loose of their earthliness so that they would be ready and prepared to go with God in the amazing things that God brought to them and to work. Now, remember also, well, I'll say that. But the first one, we'll start with Noah. Noah. So I want to think over Noah and everything that you knew about Noah. Think about his life and think about where, where. I'm giving too much away. I'll, I'll let you think on it. But think about Noah. Along with Noah, bring in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They all have this thing in common. As you think about them, bring in Moses. All of them have, have what I'm thinking of in common or what we're going to be looking at in common. As you're thinking about these, think about the Israelite nation. Along with the Israelite nation, think about Elisha. A certain period of his in, of his life. As you think about Elijah, think about John the Baptist. 
And as you think about John the Baptist, think about Jesus. What comes to mind of all of these having come? Come on. <laughs> well, I was okay until you put Christ up there. Okay. <clears throat> so, I guess what I think is that God had amazing work for them to do that could not be done without Him. True. Not, not what I'm looking for, though. But what you're saying is, is true. This is where they spent time of their life. True, but not what I'm looking for. This is a place. In the wilderness? There you go. There you go. Each one of these men and probably others that you can think of, they spent amazing time in the wilderness. Now, I, I put Noah up there because I'm thinking after the flood and thinking about what was the condition of the world after the flood. They were the only ones there, him and his family. But we look at Moses, how many years did he spend in the wilderness? Forty-ish, at least forty. An amazing amount of time. Why did Abraham? Why did he live in the wilderness? There were cities, there was towns, there were villages. Did God command him to live in the wilderness? I can't find a direct command. Is that the Lord said that He would lead him where He wanted them to be? But three generations lived in the wilderness: Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. The Israelite nation, we know that they spent 40 years in the wilderness. That first generation was out of punishment. But the, that younger generation that was raised in the wilderness also spent 40 years. And it was brought out last week that God was able to do amazing things with them. Things that when we look at it, it made no sense. You're telling me to march around the city of Jericho one time for six days and on the seventh day, seven times? Why? Why don't we just simply storm the city? That would be the earthly way of doing things, right? Just simply storm the city. But God said, no, God had his plan. And they were able to do amazing things. Elijah, we know Elijah had a difficult time. He was one that was out there serving God. And uh, he, his life was threatened. And that whole situation apparently got the best of him that he just simply wanted to give, to give up. And then he went in uh, 40, he went 40 days journey into the world. Into the wilderness. 40 days, that's a long time. And then after that, the Lord sent him to Mount Sinai, still in the wilderness. And then he had to travel all the way back. So it seems like the Lord had a way of helping his people. And we know that the, the Old Testament was uh, literal and physical in, in God's working with them in order for them to get this, the spiritual aspect of it. But he physically separated his people from the world. What is a wilderness? What do you find in the wilderness? Find Walmart in wilderness? Marketplace in, in the wilderness during their day and time? No, it is where you get away from the normal, regular ways of the world. And now your dependence is where? On God. On God and God alone in a lot of times. Now, here's my point in looking at this. One of the ways that we deal, that we have to deal with our earthliness is that we have to take every opportunity that we possibly can to get away from the, worlds of, the ways of the world. 
And here's one of the dangers I see with us as Christians. And, and uh, I, I understand why it was preached in the days of old, where they were tell them, telling them to separate themselves from the world, not going out of the world, not having yourself a little commune out in the wilderness somewhere, literally speaking, no. But you find ways where you take yourself out of the everyday ways and thinking of the world. Separate yourself. Because now you're breaking that, that influence. It seems like people no longer recognize the danger of that. And we're seeing the effect. We're seeing Christians thinking like the world. And that's where everything else starts. It starts with the thinking. And they do not take seriously this thing of the separation. Notice what Jesus says. Let's go over to the New Testament. Now, I'm not telling us to go out in the desert somewhere. I don't think it'll hurt us. I think it's do us wonders of good. <laughs> but that's not the point of this. But we need to do, we do need to find ways of uh, breaking the influence of the world. In John chapter 15, John chapter 15, notice the words that Jesus speaks here, and he emphasizes this. And we'll be living it, uh, reading this out of New Living Translation. But verse 19, Jesus says, The world will love you as one of its own if you belong to it. But you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world. So it hates you. Now, here's my question. We know that we are in the world, physically speaking. How do we come out of it? As Jesus spoke. How do we come out of it if we're in it? Because when we are in it, so many people indulge in it. But Jesus calls us out of it. How does that work? How does it work? Once again, he's going to emphasize, and we're going to look at it as he was praying to the Lord. He says, I'm not asking, Father, for you to take them out of the world. No, that's not, that's not his point. But we have to come to an understanding, how is this done? We're called out of the world. Jesus emphasized we are no longer or shouldn't be no longer a part of the world. But how do we come out of it? It should be cause for thought. It should be cause for thought. Because so many Christians are in the world and they are part of the world. They haven't answered this call. And therefore, the things that God seeks to tell us and to lift us, uh, lift us in our understanding, we can't grasp because we're so grounded in the world. We're not, we're not out of it. Look, he says it again. Look at John chapter 17. John chapter 17. And this is the part of Jesus' prayer on the behalf of those who, will be, who would follow him, uh, taking it all in context. But notice what the Lord is uh, emphasizing. He says, now I am coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world so that they will be filled with my joy. I have given them your word and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world. Just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world. So see, here's the country or, or, or sort of the confusion for many. But to keep them safe from the evil one, they do not belong to this world any more than I do. But how does that work? How does it work that we are in the world, but not of the world? And Jesus sort of gives us the answer there in verse 14, that separation takes place because he has given us his word. But 
If God's word come in conflict or it is opposed by the world's world word, uh, word, and if I'm still grounded in the world and earthly things, now we have a conflict between God's word and the earthly words or thoughts or ways. So there has to be a way and we have to be of the mind. I will take every opportunity that I can get to separate myself and to uh, limit my time in the world or the ways or the thinking of the world. I have to. One of the things that has been a, a big part of my Christian walk, I, I consider part of my uh, Christian growth, is that I seek to take opportunity of the, of the camps, the rallies, the retreats. Because those give opportunity for me to break from the world and to go and to spend time with other Christian brethren, but also other time where God's word is presented. But in a sense, I'm out of the world now. It is an amazing, and I've noticed each time that I do it, each and every year we spend a week uh, uh, there in Colorado camp. It just seems like you're coming back to a foreign country. Because you haven't heard the news for a whole week. You haven't heard about all the things that are going on, all the evil that is going on, all those things you just simply pushed aside and your focus has been with God's people and God's word. And now once you leave there and and that stuff began to flood up on you once again, it, it is an amazing difference. But it is a need. It is a need. We need to seek to keep the world out of our home where it's not constantly bombarding us every day. Every day. And I've noticed something when it comes to uh, the things that the world seeks to present to us. I like to catch the news every morning just to sort of see what has happened and what is going on. But I noticed something. After about 15, 20 minutes, they start repeating themselves. Same thing over and over again. And on the next next half hour, they repeat it again. I said, now, wait a minute. Isn't that a technique of brainwashing? It is. It is. So I turn the thing off. I hear it once. I don't need to hear it again. So I turn it off. And I try to find a a substitute to try to keep the mind occupied. But my whole point in seeing all of this, we have to find ways to limit ourselves when it comes to the influence of the world. I don't care at all about studying the ways of the world. I want to, I, I, I seek to understand how they operate and so forth and what their thinking is. But other than that, I have no interest because I understand the power of their thinking. And it goes against the things of God and the word of God. We have to find ways because we are not of this world. But we do know that the world want to reclaim us. Absolutely, they do. And that is why the influence is so strong. One more. Let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We know the 11th chapter of Hebrews is giving us these men and women of faith. And we know too that most of these men and women, they were in wilderness situations. They were not uh, connected and associated greatly with the world. And we know that they had to have some connections and so forth. But notice what it says, what, uh, what, it spe- what it is spoken of concerning them. The, ver- uh, the 13th verse, Hebrews chapter 11, the 13th verse. Here's the summary. It says, all of these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance. And get this, this next part. And having confessed that they were strangers. And exiles, New American Standard uses the word, on the earth. Now, we're seeing where God's, where Jesus himself says, we are no longer of this world. How do we see ourselves? Because these people that we read about in Hebrews chapter 11, they confess concerning themselves, we're strangers. We sing the song all the time, this world is not my home. Really? Is that a reality for us? 
Or is that just simply a song? Do we see ourselves as exiles upon this world? Or on the earth? If so, then we're going to limit ourselves when it comes to the ways, the thinkings, and the thoughts of the world. Otherwise, we are going to become worldly or gammon, and the world is going to reclaim us. We have to limit. God's way of doing it in the, in the old system was his people lived in the wilderness. They were among themselves. God's people were among themselves. God gives us that opportunity to his church body, but we're definitely in the world, but it's not supposed to be other. So that's the first thing in how we can control our, our earthliness. There is a second way. And the second way is prayer. Let's remind ourselves what prayer is. Prayer is where I spend time, where we spend time with our God, with our Savior in conversation. Just give a simple definition. I spend time conversating, speaking with God. It can be in the form of request, but it shouldn't be all in the form of request. God wants to hear our petition, our supplications, and our entreaties. Yes. But what about the times of confusion? Do we pray to God then? What about the times of distress, trouble, pain, hurry? Do we talk to God then? What about the times that we are challenged with the things or pressured with the things of the world? Do we talk to God then? I don't think we take advantage of this amazing privilege like we ought to when it comes to prayer. Now, we know that Jesus spent an amazing time in prayer, right? Have you ever wondered why? Knowing who he was, you, you ever wondered why? It seems like it would have been that Jesus would have had the, the least need to pray. The knowledge that he had, the wisdom that he had, the, the uh, uh, understanding of heaven and God that he had. Why did he need to pray? Don't forget where he was. He was here on this earth. He faced the influences of this earth. Have you ever taken the times that we read about that Jesus prayed? Have you looked at the circumstances or what was going on? Let's do that tonight. Turn with me. Let's start with Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. Let's start there with verse 22 and then we're going to expand it. But the background of this was that Jesus fed the 5,000. Uh, an amazing miracle that he did. And can you imagine the reaction of the people when they realized what had happened? But let's pick up there in verse 22. And then we're going to expand to start look at the circumstances. And notice in verse 22, read it slowly because you will find there is some urgency here. Because it starts out by saying immediately. There's some urgency here in the actions of Jesus. And this is the, these are the actions of Jesus. It says immediately he made. Look at the word. You have a footnote there. It says he compelled his disciples to get into the boat. What was going on? Why such urgency? Why such compelling? 
He had just uh, uh, did an amazing miracle, an amazing feat in feeding the 5,000. And it goes on and it says, while he sent the crowds away, after he sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Who was he praying to? It's obvious. He was praying to his father. And then when it was evening, he was there alone. But why? Why did he choose this time to go and pray? And why did he go by himself, sending his disciples away, as well as the other people that uh, he had fed? And why the length of time? Let me give you a little bit of insight. This is dealing with the uh, feeding of the 5,000. Go to John chapter 6. Same incident. Same incident. But John is giving us some insight. John here in chapter 6, he is also speaking about the feeding of the 5,000. Same event. But in verse 15, John, John points out, look at verse 15. So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force and to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. You see the pressure? the influence of the world. I'm pretty sure Jesus could have stood before these people and say, no, I am not going to be your king. But we find him getting along by himself and praying to the Father. Same incident. We, when we encounter the pressures of the world, because this is not why Jesus was sent here from here, to be king of any nation or kingdom. That was not his mission. When we encounter things that pull us away from our mission, God's will that we know that God wants us to do, What is our actions? What do we do? So many people just simply go with the influence. They just sort of ride the wave or whatever it happens to be. See, Satan is going to do his very best to get us out of the will of God. He is. And he's going to um, use the influences of this earth. He offers us, we're told anyway, better job, pays more, it may require us to move and no longer have be around a faithful church. You realize how many people just simply follow the pressure? Follow the pressure. The Lord maybe have given them and helped them to know this is what I want you to do. But because of influences, various kinds of influences, in a sense, people drop out. And they're no longer doing God's will. That God has specifically said, I'm calling you to this. It just drop out because of worldly influences. See, you will find, and we're going to be looking at a few others. You will find that when Jesus went to pray, he was facing encountering earthly influences, earthly pressure, even earthly success. Even success. Let me show you another one. 
Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Verse 35, we find a situation here. Now, we know Jesus, he had a ministry that just simply meaning that he was out serving the people, uh, helping the people to come to know and understand God. And also, we have to understand the tendency of the people. A lot of times people overlook the call to come to God and they just, in a sense, want the blessings that Jesus was giving them. Because of that 5,000, you know what really appealed to them? It was the bread. They were fed. And Jesus pointed that out to them. And even when Jesus had the healings and the miracles as well, you know what was most prominent before the people? It was that they were being healed, not necessarily the call of God. Jesus understood that. But look at this situation here in our Mark chapter 1, picking up there in verse 35. It says, in the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, And went away to a secluded place and was praying there. Simon and his companions searched for him and they found him and said to him, get this, get this uh, statement. Everyone is looking for you. Jesus, this isn't the time to be out here praying. People are desiring you. Everyone is looking for you, uh, it said. But notice what Jesus said, verse 38. He said to them, let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that, I, so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. Now, what was the circumstances going on here as well? Let's all go back a little bit and sort of pick up what was taking place here. You go to uh, the 29th verse, still the same chapter, Mark chapter 1, 29th verse we see uh, that Jesus came out of the synagogue and they came, uh, when and immediately they came out of the synagogue. They came into the house of Simon and Andrew and with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was laying sick with a, with a fever and immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. He came to her and raised her up, taking her by the hand and the fever left her and she waited on them. When evening came, after the sun had set, they began to bring him all who were ill and all those who were demon possessed and the whole city gathered at the door. Success. And he healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. And then we go on in verse 35 that we've already read. Jesus got up in the middle of the night, went away by himself. He prayed. You realize how influencing success can be. Think about it with me. What if, and I pray that it does, what if things began to happen here? What I mean by that was that people began to be converted. And the church here got to a thousand. 2,000, 3,000, 5,000. Be amazing, wouldn't it? But how would that affect us? Have you ever thought about it? How would it affect us? When it comes to Success. And this was a spiritual matter. Helping people, healing people. But Jesus had a need to get away and to pray in order to stay focused. Stay focused. His mission was to get as many people as possible to come and to know and to understand his father. So even though things were going great here, as far as the miraculous, he says, let's go to another place. 
Because I need to preach there too. Amazing circumstances behind our Lord's praying. But we're seeing the, the, the things that are going on that brought him to this point of seeking and being before his father. Let's, get, let's look at one more. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. We'll pick up there in verse 12. It says, it was at this time that he, this is making reference to Christ, went off to the mountain to pray. And he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them whom he also named as apostles. So here we have him going to pray all night long. But we see the task that he had at hand. Why did this present a need for prayer and choosing number 12? Well, making the right choices would be one, but he was the Lord. But I think there was another aspect there. Because among the 12 that he chose to be his closest followers, there was one, and Jesus knew it, that was going to betray him. Now, it would have been easy to exclude this man from the group, knowing what he was going to do. But once again, he knew what the mission was and what had to take place. Go ahead. He would have decided and said, yeah, exactly. No thank, you. no, thank you. But when we think of Judas and we're talking about Judas Iscariot, do you realize that we have no clue in the writings that Jesus treated this man any different than he did of the other 12? Here's why I say this. When they were asked, when Jesus made the statement at the Lord's Supper, and he clearly made the statement, one of you is going to betray me. And they were beginning to go around the table and they said, well, what is my? They had no inkling that it was Judas. Even Judas took the question. It, it was already in his heart, but we know how people seek to be deceitful and so forth and hide their, their uh, true actions or feelings. Judas even put the question, but the rest of the disciples, they had no clue. This man, Judas, was sent on the same missions that they were. He did the same work that they did. He also cast out demons as the other ones did. There was no difference whatsoever. And even when Jesus gave Judas the statement, basically paraphrasing, you go ahead and do what you're going to do. You remember the scriptures even tell us tell us that the disciples thought that he was going to do some missionary work or service because he was holding money. They had no idea. So even in this choosing. Of those who were going to be working with him and close to him. Jesus saw the need for prayer. In order to carry this thing out, he knew the end. Let me read just a little bit more. So to give you the circumstances. If you go to verse 14, we're given the names of the, uh, the ones that were chosen. Uh, Judas was the last one on the list at the end of verse 16 there. But then we come and look at verse 17. It says, Jesus came down with them. This was the disciples, so the 12 that he had chosen. Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place. And there was a large crowd of his disciples. And a great throng of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were being uh, cured. And all the people were trying to touch him for power was coming from him and healing them all. 
So once again, we're looking at this success. On top of that, the choosing of those who are going to be working with him, not only with him, but when he returns to heaven, then these men were going to be carrying that work on. Very important choice. But as we look at these two things, spending or separating or spending time separated from the world and also being in prayer with our Father, our God. These are two things, not saying it's the only things, but these are two things that, that will help us to resist the pull of this war. They are very, very important. So let us seek not to be of this world. That's Jesus' desire for us. And we have to give thought, what does that mean for you specifically? What does it mean for you? And let us be people of prayer. We have a refuge from this world in our God. Also in his, in his people as well. So let us use these refuge. And we can go a long way that as the Lord seeks to lead us in spiritual things. That they won't seem odd to us.